morning. If you're visiting with us, we are delighted to have you in our presence. And uh, if you wouldn't mind filling out one of the uh, blue cards on the back of the pews in front of you, pass those towards the center aisles. Our ushers will come down in just a few moments and collect those. And we'd like to have a record of your attendance with us. And if we can help you in any way, please let us know. And uh, if you have a few minutes afterwards to stick around so that we can uh, meet you and make you feel welcome here, please do so. Uh, opening song this morning is number 684. 684. Matthew Weaver will lead us in our uh, song service this morning. Just a few announcements uh, to go through. Um, nothing new other than what's in the, the bulletin, uh, I believe. And uh, just to kind of recap, don't forget our, our VBS kickoff is uh, Sunday, June the 15th at 5 p.m. Again, this VBS, as we've mentioned several times, is a p.m. VBS, not an a.m. VBS as we've had in the past. Uh, so please, uh, please keep that in mind. Uh, one question was asked if there's going to be an uh, adult classes for this VBS as well as the kid classes, and the answer is yes. Uh, there will be an adult class uh, Monday and Tuesday night, and of course our summer series is Wednesday. Uh, so if, if you come, you're not just dropping your kids off. There is something here for, for adults as well. Uh, so it, it, is, it is open for all. And uh, so please make notes uh, on the, the dates there for that, 15th through the 18th. And um, it'll be the kickoff on Sunday. I think there are still flyers on the back of the, the foyer there on the table. You can grab one on your way out if you haven't taken one already. We mentioned this past Wednesday, the Lonnie and Jackie Jones, their uh, Bible study that they have at their home uh, has been moved from tomorrow to Tuesday uh, of this coming week or, or this week. Uh, so uh, you need to correct your calendars. It will not be on Monday tomorrow, but it'll be on Tuesday. Uh, the rest should be on Monday unless there's any other alterations that come up. Uh, prime timers, don't forget you'll be meeting Tuesday night at 6 in the fellowship hall and uh, you're asked to bring a covered dish and join in the fun and games and activity and good food. One Honduras announcement, uh, we've mentioned that we've uh, finished up our houses and we're, we're thankful for everybody's uh, uh, fundraising involvement in that. And um, the things that we do need uh, that we've mentioned are over-counter medication. Uh, there's, there's a note in the bulletin about you know, some of the pain reliever stuff and allergy medication. Uh, there's also a list on the table if you want to grab one on the way out. And if you're out at a Walmart or Target, wherever you shop for groceries, if you can pick up something small uh, medication-wise that we can take with us, uh, Pepto-Bismol and Modium, uh, not to embarrass Sherry Womack, but she came up to me after class this morning and gave a, a little bag here and there's about four or five flip-flops and we've asked for flip-flops and, and shoes for school-aged children. There's about two or three pairs of reading glasses that we've asked for and uh, those came from the Dollar Tree, I understand. So uh, probably less than 10 bucks, I, I imagine, and uh, shoes for kids and, and reading glasses. And uh, those are the things that we're asking for as we, we try to finalize our preparations there. I believe that's all the announcements I have. I do have one card. Thank you so much for the Bible that I received on behalf of the congregation. I'm beyond blessed to have a church family that continues to support me. I love and appreciate each and every one of you. Love, Kendra Osmer. Let's begin our worship this morning. Uh, before we begin our, our songs of praise, uh, Steve Harless will lead us in our opening prayer. We'll have our closing prayer by Brother Tim Fairchild. Let's begin our worship together. Bow with me, please. Father, we come to you, your throne of grace and prayer as a congregation, thinking of the things that we have going on here as well as in the mission field. Father, we recognize that there are many activities, many events that uh, we need you to bless, and we pray that much good will come from these activities here locally as well as abroad. Father, we know that there are those in our mission field that work tirelessly to spread your word, and we recognize that good things are coming from that, and we pray that you'll give those missionaries strength as they continue to, to teach others, to establish congregations, and to grow their their numbers. Father, we pray for those locally here as well that are leading us, that you will <clears throat> grant them the same measure of strength 
in knowledge and that they'll lead us uh, in the right direction, that they will help us to raise families that are strong Christians, that the church will, will grow and not shrink in number and that we will also grow spiritually. Father, we pray for those that are sick that are not with us. We know we have a large number of our members that have ongoing health issues and have to have constant care and uh, we just imagine how they have to deal with each day the loneliness, potentially pain, uh, and we pray for their comfort and that they will always be in our minds that we can reach out to them and comfort them as well. And it's, these are opportunities that we have to show your love and, and the world will know we're, we're Christians by the love that we show our fellow men. Father, we pray that you'll go through this worship with us that our minds will be concentrated solely on your greatness, your mercy, your love, the things you've done for us. And Father, we pray that we'll have opportunities to share our knowledge with those in the world that are in great need of your spiritual health. All these things we ask our Father in Christ's name, amen. Number 684. 684, let's do the first and third verses. <clears throat> this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are the gods, so turn me out of the blue. The angels beckon me from. Number 223. 223. Again, let's do the first and the last verse. Often I'm hindered on my way.
Lord's Supper this morning. <clears throat> Let's sing number 784. 784. And do the first and second verses of this one. <clears throat> Why did my Savior come to earth? so thankful for this day you've given us the opportunity we have to come to worship you today we come thanking thee for thy son who died upon the cross and made the perfect sacrifice that we might have remission of our sins through that blood heavenly father we pray that you will be with us as we protect this emblem which represents that body that hang on the cross examine ourselves and do so in a manner well pleasing in thy sight in Christ's name we pray
Let us pray. Our Father and our God in heaven, we are thankful for this day. We are thankful for the blessing of life. We are so thankful for your Son and our Savior and the sacrifice that he made on the cross. We pray now as we partake of this cup, which represents the blood that was shed upon the cross, that we partake of it in a well-pleasing manner. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. we give our offering to God this morning, let's sing number 888, 888, and do the first and third verses of this one. Thank you, Lord, for loving me, and thank you, Lord, for blessing me, thank you, Lord, for making me whole and saving my soul. come to you today thanking you for all the blessings you give us thanking you for the spiritual blessings and now for the material blessings father help us to give back to you what is rightfully yours to give cheerfully and willingly and to know that it will be used to your purpose this we ask in Jesus name
Please mark number 770, 770. We'll see that after the lesson this morning. And before our lesson, turn to number 300, 300. And we'll do the first, third, and fourth verses. And if you'd like to, please stand. I will sing of my Redeemer and His wondrous love to me. Welcome to Maysville. We are glad that you're here. We appreciate your presence. Those who are a part of our congregation, we always expect and look forward to the opportunity to get together. But we also have many visitors, and we're thankful that you've come to be with us. We hope we'll get to meet you, welcome you, and that you'll come back and see us again whenever you have the opportunity. Let me give you a reminder, or at least a, um, a little preparation. If you have allowed your reading in our, our study of Matthew to get behind, today would be a great day to catch up. Uh, today is June the 8th. We have been trying to read through daily schedule so that you keep up with the book of Matthew. That means to read through chapter 8, if you'd gotten behind in the month of June, would probably only take you about 15 minutes. I told you a few weeks ago that we were going to set off our discussion in Matthew for a little while because of some other things that were coming up, but that will continue tonight. Our lesson this evening will be from Matthew chapter 12, which is actually a little farther in your reading than Matthew chapter 8, but uh, jump up and grab that one as well, and uh, you'll be ready for our discussion this evening. I'd like for you to open your Bibles, if you would, to Romans chapter 10 for us to begin reading in just a moment. Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. I like to listen to, SP, 
to experts, don't you? When people who really know what they're talking about, they've studied, they're prepared, they, they, they have the answers, they know the information. It's not speculation. It's not um, uh, just a research project. Several months ago, I was invited to speak on a lectureship. And the topics that, uh, that they wanted me to speak on, I told them, I wrote back and said, I really don't think I can address those with the level of competence that you've come to expect from the lectureship. I said, I can prepare research on them, but I have no experience with the issues in life that are described. We want people who have knowledge of things when they're going to explain how things work, how they fit together. Well, if there was any topic that Paul knew about, it was the zeal of those who would claim to be Israel. That is, those who made up the Jewish nation. Certainly, Paul was aware of the, the concept of zeal. I want to read from a variety of places this morning as we uh, look to our discussion, starting in Galatians chapter 1. Paul will begin to tell the, uh, uh, the church there about his relationship with them and also about what they know about him. Galatians chapter 1, start reading in verse 13. When Paul was talking about the zeal of the Jews, listen. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. If there was anybody around who knew about religious zeal on the part of the Jews, it was Paul. But Paul also understood the topic of Israel. Paul was a Jew. In fact, he would make a statement in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And he would say, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. There were several categories of people who lived in the first century. When we read scripture, we have statements made about Jews and Gentiles. We have statements made about Greeks and barbarians. We have statements made about believers and non-believers. But when Paul addressed the topic of those who were of Israel, and he described those who were Jewish. He could stand among them and say, I am one of you. When he described them, he was not talking about a category that he didn't know anything about. Sometimes when people address an issue or talk about a subject, and they divide any kind of a group into us and them, they may not know anything about them. They may not like them. They may put them in a different kind of category, whether we're talking about a group of people that we don't like or don't want anything to do with or that we object to something that they believe or teach or practice or anything else. Whether we're talking about Democrats and Republicans, whether we're talking about Alabama and Auburn, any, anything. When you talk about a them, can you identify with the them? Paul understood who, pardon my grammar here, who them was. He knew them. He was them. He would describe himself to the Philippians, circumcised on the eighth day, the stock of Israel, from the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew among Hebrews. He knew what it meant. He wasn't describing a group of people with, with no concern or casually dismissing them. Acts chapter 22, begin reading in verse 3. Paul has been taken into custody. He's in the city of Jerusalem. He's addressing a mob of people. 
Listen how he describes himself. Acts 22, 3. I am indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our Father's law, and was zealous toward God as you all are today. He knew they were zealous. He knew they were Israel. He knew something else about them, though, also. He also knew about mistaken zeal. They were religious, but they were wrong. In fact, he'll go on in our reading there, since we're already opened up to Acts chapter 22. Let's continue a little bit and follow Paul's recognition of how he knew about wrong and misguided zeal. I persecuted this way, and in the terminology this way refers to Christianity, to the death. Binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest bears me witness, and all the council of the elders from whom I also received letters to the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. Now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a loud voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now there are a lot of times where we find ourselves, perhaps in life, imagining what it would be like to be in the shoes of another person. That, depending on our conversation, can be either sympathy or empathy. There are slightly variation differences. What would it have been like to have been Paul, or Saul of Tarsus, as he was at this point? Involved in persecuting Christians, traveling on that mission, and as he is along the way, there is a man who is an enemy of his. The enemy is dead, Jesus of Nazareth. And he's persecuting anyone who has anything to do with Jesus. Remember Paul's topic in Romans chapter 10 that we read a while ago is, Paul understands the concept that they were religiously zealous that they wanted to serve God. And Paul knows this because he was there. Saul of Tarsus was a zealous man. He was zealous to do what God's will was, as he understood it. He was zealous to the persecuting of Christians, even to putting men and women to death, binding them in chains. Now he's on this journey. He's on this mission. And while he's traveling along, he has an encounter. The only way to describe this as a, is as a mir miraculous event. A miracle happens to Saul of Tarsus. A light shines upon him from heaven. Jesus speaks to him from heaven. How do we know it's Jesus? Because he identifies himself. He says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And when you heard that moment... How do you explain that? I was watching a little television the other day, flipping past channels. Happened to come across um, the financial discussion, Susie Orman, who's on. And I really, I don't watch the show much, occasionally for a moment or two. But as I was passing through it, she always puts up on the, on the board the description of the circumstances of the caller, and it intrigued me. Because it said the woman, the wife, had taken out a $70,000 line of credit on their house and hadn't told her husband about it. And now he was wanting to take out a line of credit on the same house. And she says, he's going to find out. What should I do? Oh, no. We may not be able to sympathize in the fact that we have not been there, hopefully. But we certainly can empathize. We can think about the fact that if a person was there, they, are, they, are, they have made a, a loan, brought financial responsibility to their 
to their family, but one of the parties didn't know about it, and now they're going to be found out. It's going to be shown, oh, this is a terrible place to be. Here's Saul of Tarsus. He's traveling on the road. He's persecuting these people known as Christians who are following after Jesus. And while he's there trying to put people in jail for being Christians, he has a conversation with Jesus himself. And Jesus says, Hey, buddy, you're wrong. Paul says, I bear them record that they have a zeal for God, but it is not according to knowledge. They are wrong. In fact, Paul pops up and makes five quick statements about them as they unfold. Number one, they were zealous for God. We've already discussed that. Number two, it was not according to knowledge. They were wrong on the facts. There's a statement that occurs in the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 22, as Jesus is discussing life with the Samaritan woman. She has said, our people worship here on this mountain. Your people worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus answers her and says, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. Jesus' statement to her is, you're wrong. You're wrong because your, your actions are based on things that you can't prove. They are not true. What we're doing is true. The Jews, in res refusing to follow after God, were not according to knowledge. And then Paul goes on. It says, they were ignorant of God's righteousness. The word that is translated there, ignorant, is uh, the same word from which we get our word agnostic. It's used in a description of, of the twelve in Mark chapter 9, verse 32. After Jesus had described to this, his disciples, he's telling them about uh, uh, what's coming up in life, and he's explaining his crucifixion and the resurrection. He's going to be taken by the Jews, and they don't understand it, but they're afraid to ask about it. And the word is translated there that, that, that they did not understand is the same word that is translated in Romans chapter 10. That they are ignorant of God's righteousness. They don't understand. Paul was not calling them a name. Paul was describing their condition. They did not comprehend what God intended for His people. Because they didn't understand, then they were going to be making some mistakes. If you have incorrect knowledge, then there are going to be some issues that come up wrongly. I read in my Bible class this morning from Acts chapter 17, where Paul is in Mars, at Mars Hill on the Areopagus. And referring back to that again, in Acts chapter 17, Paul is in a place where he is talking to people who are religious, but they're, they're not right. Paul says in Acts 17, 22, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. There's our word again, without knowing. The one whom you are worshiping ignorantly. You don't comprehend. Paul says, I'm going to tell you about him. Not only were they ignorant, they didn't know God's plan. But a fourth statement Paul says about them is they went about to try to establish their own plan. The Jews in Jesus' day were far from following the law of Moses. There were certain aspects of it that they were following, but they were very mistaken. Some of that we will deal with tonight in our lesson. But Paul makes one more statement about them. He says, they've refused to submit themselves to God. I don't know how significant the word submission is to you as a person. Perhaps it might make a difference whether you're male or female. 
But the concept of submission is built into the idea of Christianity. We cannot be a child of God without being in submission to God. So Paul has described in Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, the, the person of Israel, the person who is Jewish, who Paul says, I'm telling you about them. They are zealous for God, but they're wrong. But then there's also the opposite. You not only have this person who thought they were right with Jesus and who thought they were or thought they were right with God and had, had rejected Jesus. But you've also got those who are a part of Jesus, who were perceived badly. Edward Gibbon was a English historian, member of parliament, lived in the um, 1700s. He wrote a series of books that were probably the best known of his his works. So usually they are shortened to the rise, excuse me, to the, uh, um, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. The whole series was titled The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. First was published in 1776 and then six volumes uh, over the next few years finally being finished up in 1788. In that series of very scholarly writings. One of the things that happens in volume one is he spends a great deal of time describing why Christianity spread through the Roman Empire and the significance that it had on its spread. And he gives five reasons as to why the gospel spread through the Roman Empire so effectively. Now, I'm going to begin reading with the number two reason. We'll come to the first one last. His five reasons. Number two, the doctrine of future life. Number three, miraculous powers ascribed to the early church. Number four, the pure and austere morals of the Christians. Number five, the union and discipline of the Christian Republic. All of these things were attractive to a Roman Empire. But his very first reason for the spread of Christianity The church grew because of its inflexible and intolerant zeal. Now that's an interesting statement. It's inflexible and intolerant zeal. Those are two words that are not going to be well accepted into our modern day world. When we talk about people who are inflexible and they are intolerant, uh, there's another word that usually come up, comes up with that that we throw out in the same batch, bigoted. That's what that word means. It means one who will not accept another point of view. So what was it that, that's being described about these people? What, what is it? What were they unwilling to, to change? How were they uncompromising? How were they intolerant? Was it because they would not compromise with the world? Was it because they would not negotiate concerning the things of God, that the morals of God were fixed and set, and they were not going to be subject to change or alteration? I think we can take these from statements in Scripture themselves and do a great service. Starting in Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 18. Acts 20, 18. When they had come to him, he said... You know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I have always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Clearly... Here's Paul's statement. He says, this is what I've done, and I've done it publicly. I've done it house to house. This is what I'm involved in. Jump down to verse 25. And indeed, now I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent 
of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Paul said there is a body of material. I have made sure that you have it. This is what you're going to need to, to know, what you're going to follow, what you're going to be a part of. Down to verse 33. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who are, with me, uh, who are with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Inflexible and intolerant? Because Paul believed in right and wrong? Because there was a morality? Because there were issues? Does intolerant, does the word intolerant belong because they were, they were unwilling uh, to give in to errors? Let's go over, since we're in the book of Acts, rather than, than move back and forth, let's drop back to Acts chapter 15 for just a moment and read this one first. Acts chapter 15, verse 1. Certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. All right, we have a doctrinal question that has come up in the early church. There's a group of people who want to hold part of the Old Testament and bring it, fold it into the New Covenant. They want circumcision included in any discussion of Christianity. Now, was the church intolerant and inflexible if they did not allow these things to be brought in? Let's take our reading back to the book of Galatians. Let's start in chapter 2. The book of Galatians is unique in one sense because it records a record of Paul dealing with one of the most strident issues in the early church and his attempt to try to prevent them from falling away into error. And it has very strong words. Galatians 2, 1. After 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. I went by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. To whom, well, listen to verse 5. To whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. You know what Paul did when confronted with a problem that was doctrinal? He did not move. Well, what if it made these people unhappy? He did not move. Well, what if they turned away from him because of it? He did not move. Well, what if they refused to believe him? He did not move. These things were true. They were right. They were matters of conviction, matters of faith, matters of God's instruction. Intolerant. by some standards, might be called intolerant. Unflexible, by some standards, might be called unflexible. When we live in a world where people are afraid of anything that is absolute, where there is, there is no statement of fact, often it's opinion or something else. Paul goes on, Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This was truth. It wasn't up for speculation. Chapter 5, verse 1. 
Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised. He is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to become justified by law. You have fallen from grace. Every Bible student knows of the warnings of the Old Testament. The prophets, the preachers who were raised up, those who wrote, those who preached, they warned of the things that were coming. There's a statement made in the book of Isaiah chapter 5 where in just a few verses, over and over again, Isaiah uses the word woe. Woe was a warning. A warning of what is to come. A warning of, of trouble that is ahead. warning of things that were going to, to happen to them if they didn't change their ways. Isaiah chapter 5, starting in verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe to men mighty at drinking wine. Woe to men valiant for mixing intoxicating drink who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away justice from the righteous man. Therefore, as the fire devours the stubble and the flame consumes the chaff, so their root will be as rottenness and their blossom will ascend like dust because they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Isaiah turns to these people and says, what tragedy is going to come upon you. Destruction is going to come upon you. Why? Because you don't understand good and evil. Because you don't understand right and wrong. You have turned away from the things that God has said are right. And you have surrounded yourself with immorality. What do you brag about? How much you can drink? How evil you are? How much money you can steal from others? This is the things you brag about? It says God is going to destroy you like a fire burns up chaff. And, and the, the things of your life are going to appear like dust. There were issues in the New Testament as well. Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and following. He says, The Spirit expressly says in latter times, men will depart from the faith. They'll give heed to seducing, to seducing spirits. They will teach lies. They will tell you things you can't eat. They will tell you things you can't do. They're not true. They're not right. Don't follow them. Intolerant. Inflexible. The very beginning of the book of Isaiah starts off like this. We'll pick up in verse 2. Isaiah 1, 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, the donkey its master's crib. But Israel does not know, my people do not consider. Alas, a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward. The writers of the New Testament also spoke of willful, willful ignorance. In the book of Hebrews chapter 5, the writer of Hebrews turns to his audience and says, by this time in your experience, you should be teachers. But you have need that someone teach you again the first principles of Christ. We don't know how long they had been Christians. We don't know what the circumstances were in their lives. We don't know many things about them. But we have an obligation to know and to follow truth. One of the statements that Paul makes concerning elders in 1 Timothy chapter 3 is that an elder be apt to teach. 
that he understand and have a knowledge of, of the will of God. Paul goes on from that even much stronger in the book of Ephesians, excuse me, in the book of Titus. Titus chapter 1, beginning in verse 7, For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-control. But watch what happens when he comes to verse 9. Now, that's, that's most of the list of the, uh, the qualities of an elder. But then he changes to the topic of knowledge. Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convict those who contradict. For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. Intolerant and inflexible zeal. Maybe that's a badge of honor that ought to be worn. If we were zealous for God and uncompromising with the world and unwilling to allow our message to be diluted, how would the world describe us? When Paul wrote to the church in Corinth and told them about their experiences, he told them what he taught them. And it described in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 the, the, the message that he had brought to them. Verse 1, Brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you. There was something they needed to believe and something they needed to do. It's interesting, if we'd have read down a little farther in the discussion we had in Acts chapter 22, when Saul was on the road and the Lord spoke to him, and Saul says in response, Lord, what would you have me to do? Now, there are a lot of religious people who today would say, well, there's nothing. He's already called him Lord, so he's done. But you know, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus didn't say, you know, Saul, there's nothing you've got to do now. You've already believed. You've been saved. That's not what he told him. He said, go into the city, and it will be told you what you must do. Continuing in Acts chapter 22, Paul tells about his own continuing story. He says that a man named Ananias came to me. And he told me about Jesus, and he told me what I was going to have to do. And he told me, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts chapter 22, verse 16. I'll end with those thoughts this morning. Why are you waiting? It may be that you are not a Christian this morning. You've never been obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ. God is intolerant and inflexible. Those who are not washed under the blood of Jesus, through the blood of the cross, the sacrifice that was made for the cross, was made for humanity. When Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, that the gospel should go to all of the world, that those who believed should be saved, those who believe and are baptized shall be saved. Those who do not believe will not. They'll be condemned. Believe and be baptized. Those are the words of Jesus. If this morning you need to respond to those words and be baptized for the remission of sins, we invite you in a moment when the invitation song is sung that you come forward and let it be known. It may be that you're a child of God but not faithful. You need to come home. The invitation is for you. God is forgiving to us here.
But there will come a time when we will stand before God in judgment. Make your life right. And if you need to respond this morning, come as we stand and sing. While Jesus whispers to you, come Next time of services will be tonight at 5 p.m. We hope we can see everyone there. I have one final announcement. Uh, there's an elders and deacons meeting today at 3.30. If you're visiting with us, we thank you for being here and stick around for a little bit. Let us get to know you and hope to see everyone at 5 o'clock tonight. Closing song will be number 754, 754. And let's do the first and fourth verses before we're dismissed in prayer. When Jesus comes to reward his servants, whether it be noon or night, faithful to him will he find us watching with us. Father, we come to you today thanking you for this service, thanking you for allowing us to come together, fellowship with one another. Thank you for the words that we've heard, the message from your word. We pray that this message will go forward with us and that we will take it out into the world and that we'll be a, a good example and that we'll draw people closer to you. We pray, Lord, for strength in this world, intestinal fortitude to stick to what is right. We pray that as we do go out in the world, that we'll remember that everyone has a soul and every soul is precious. Let us always look to a way to help others, give them strength, and be a good example that they will want to change their ways someday. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.